opportunity that we're going to have um, to chat with some of our alumni about their homestay experiences. Um, I'm going to introduce myself first. Um, I'm Michelle Walters. I work with AIFS over on the West Coast. Um, and I've been with the organization for about 12 years. And I'm also actually an AFS alumni. I studied abroad with them at the University of Limerick more than 12 years ago. Um, and I did not have the opportunity to, ha to do a homestay on my study abroad program. Um, but after hearing you know, everyone's stories and their experiences, I sort of wish that had been an option for me. Um, so I'm gonna let Angela, my co-host, um, go ahead and introduce herself and then we can have the alumni ambassadors introduce themselves as well. Excellent, hello everyone. My name is Angela Manginelli. My pronouns are she, her, hers. My title is Vice President Director of Alumni and Inclusion Initiatives at AIFS Study Abroad. Uh, I did a faculty-led program the fall of 2001 in London, um, and uh, I did not have the opportunity to have a homestay experience either, but I definitely, if I studied abroad now, I would uh, be opting into that myself as well. Excited to have all of you here with us. I'm gonna go, go ahead and call out the alum as I see them. So Alina, if you wanna start. Yeah, hi, um, my name is Alina. I am a sophomore at the University of California, Berkeley. I studied abroad in Granada, Spain, and I had studied Spanish prior to going there through my high school. Sadie? Hi, I'm Sadie, she, her, hers. I go to Champlain College, which is in Vermont, um, and I studied in Berlin in the fall of 2019 for the semester. Um, I had taken German in high school and a couple semesters in college before I got there. Cool. Madison? Hi, I'm Madison. I go by she, her, hers, and I'm a senior at Texas A&M University, um, and I studied abroad with AIFS in Buenos Aires, Argentina in spring 2020, and I studied Spanish for about three years before I did my study abroad with them. Whitney? Hi, I'm Whitney. I'm a senior at the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater. I studied abroad this past spring um, in Grenoble, France, and I had been taking French for about 10 years before I went abroad. Great. Thank you all. Um, as you can see, we had a lot of language learners, um, but you don't necessarily need to have um, intensive language background to have a homestay. So for this session, I'm going to go over a few slides just about AIFS if you've never heard of us or this is the first time you're kind of checking into our programs. And then we're going to go ahead and get right at it and hear all about their homestay experiences. So really quickly, just an overview of our organization. We've been around since the mid 60s. And so that means that we have sent a lot of students abroad throughout the years, almost two, mi two million at this point have gone abroad on one of our summer semester J term faculty led programs or year long programs too. Um, which means we get to know students from all over the country and all over the world. Um, we have programs in 35 program cities and I think 23 or 24 different countries. Um, you'll have to check out our website to uh, fact check me, but um, all of them are listed there. We do um, some really cool options um, and we'll talk a little bit about, but one of my favorite things that we do that I think is a little bit different is we have multi-country traveling programs. Um, and with AIFS, um, I know you just heard that a lot of our students have learned the language before um, or have practiced or been you know, studying it for many years, but there are no specific language requirements for any of our programs. So you can take courses in English or in the host language. We work with all majors and we have programs from graduating high school seniors through graduating college seniors, um, which makes it really flexible for y'all to get abroad. Um, and one thing that I really appreciate about the organization is that we really try and make budgeting um, easy and, and our programs affordable so, for students. So we guarantee all of our program fees in US dollars. So y'all don't have to worry about the fluctuation of uh, currencies um, as you're planning. So what does that actually mean when it comes to budgeting and what is included in AIFS program? I would say that most of our alumni or a lot of our alumni, including myself, would say one of the reasons why they chose to study abroad with AIFS was because our program pretty much includes everything that you'll need for when you go abroad. Um, if you were anything like me, I went to a state university. I didn't have you know, funds thrown you know, all over the place. I used financial aid to go abroad. And so it was really important for me to find an affordable program and find one that had a lot packed into it. Um, with AFS, we include, you know, pre-departure support. We have all of your housing and meals are taken care of. Um, 
before you get abroad. Um, we have resident you know, directors and staff um, on each location. So if anything comes up while you're overseas, they're there to help support you. Um, they're also planning a lot of um, excursions and cultural activities that you can participate in through your time overseas and really you know, welcoming you to that city and that location. Um, we, you know, very importantly these days, we include health and travel insurance. Um, and then there is the option for you all to look at um, taking our flight packages, which are available for most US cities. Um, and then when you come back, you can be like these wonderful ambassadors here and you can share all about your experience. And we have a lot of alumni program support um, for when you come home. And then just really quickly about the types of programs we have, um, you know, many students, um, you know, kind of are at the beginning stages of figuring this all out. And there are so many options. Um, can you go back really quick? So many options for you all to, to, to take a part of. So we have traditional study abroad programs, we have, which basically means you are taking courses at a local university or center. We do internships and we have community engagement programs, which um, is where you'll spend a chunk of your time in the classroom, but also a chunk of your time working and engaging with the local community. We offer programs throughout the semester and the academic year. Through the summer, if you're looking for something short term, we do programs for about 12 or two to 12 weeks. Um, and then we also have J-term programs. For the J-term programs, you're really gonna wanna make sure that those um, options fit within your academic calendar. Um, as I mentioned before, we do have, you know, our programs are open to students from all different majors. Um, and, but that doesn't necessarily mean you have to take your major specific courses abroad. You definitely can, but many students kind of, you know, want to study abroad and they want their schedule to be flexible. Um, and so you can take courses in your major, you can take courses in your minor, you can do electives. I always suggest students, you know, um, really try and figure out as early as you can what courses you have to take abroad or you have to take at home versus what courses you can take abroad. And maybe if you're able to work it into your schedule, take one fun course that you would never take at your home university. Um, when I was studying abroad in Ireland, I was a communication major, and so I took courses in my major, I finished up my minor while I was there, and then I had one um, course available to take that was just going to be so out of the box, and so I took traditional Irish music and dance, which I am not musical and I am not a dancer, so it was definitely out of the box and different for me, but it was such a cool way to learn the culture and get to know Ireland from, you know, local perspective. Um, like I said before, there's no previous language um, requirements. Um, obviously, it does help to know the language at least a little bit to survive the first couple days, but we will help you and support you um, throughout the entire process. And lastly, just an idea of some of the program locations that we talked about. So you can kind of look and see work all over the world. You know, we've got some programs in Latin America, we have programs in Europe. Um, uh, South Africa, we do Australia, New Zealand. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities for you to really figure out what the location is that's gonna fit you best and what, uh, you know, what um, specific uh, universities that you may want to work with. Cool. And I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing the PowerPoint now so we can all see each other a little bit, uh, a little bit better. And I did want, I'm really excited to uh, to announce that Kamani was able to join us. So if you'd be able to introduce yourself to the crowd. Hello, everyone. My name is Kimani Thomas Najil. Um, as you may or may not know, I'm a senior here at Rowan University. Um, I previously studied abroad in Granada, Spain, my fall semester 2019, my junior year, which was an amazing and wonderful experience. And like pretty much everyone who is in this call. I stayed in the homestay, um, which it, it was a great experience. And I'm not sure how far, you know, we've, everyone has talked about homestays, but Angela, not that far at all. You are perfect timing. <laughs> so don't worry, we still have all the questions to go. Um, Thank you. So yeah, that concludes my introduction. Um, I nice see everyone again. And hope everyone's doing well. Thanks, Kamani. It's so great for you to join us, um, especially since we have a student from your campus, I think. Right way to Rowan. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Um, who also has said that he had a bar on, uh, well, which is an I traditional Irish instrument that I learned how to play. I'm um, not very good at it, but I learned how to play it. Um, so we are going to go ahead and get into all things homestays. Um, 
the first question that I have for the panel is uh, one that I want y'all to answer, but we're going to start off with Madison. Um, what was the composition of your homestay family? I mean, who, you know, what did it look like? So many, you know, for me, I had no idea what a homestay would look like. I had this image in my head, but for you all, what was the realities of the family or the senora that, you know, that you stayed with? Yeah, so I know, um, you know, going into that a lot of times, especially coming from Texas, you think of like the nuclear family, like, you know, two parents and some little kids. Um, and when I was filling out my application, I said I was pretty much open to anything. So I lived in an apartment in a kind of residential area with a single mother and her two sons who were 18 and I think 24. I mean, in Latin America, it's super common to stay with your parents until you get married. Um, and so she had a boyfriend who didn't live with her, but he'd come over and cook for us pretty frequently. And I also lived with another girl from AIFS who was in the bedroom across from me. Um, and she's actually one of my best friends to this day. So that was just a really great experience. And this was pretty unique to me. I wouldn't say this would happen to everybody, but in the same building upstairs, like two floors, we had another girl from AIFS living with this other lady. And so we would do like group dinners. We would go up there. I mean, she was living with just a single woman. Um, so it was just Sam and then Rosabel, and we would cook dinner with them and we would switch off. So it was like one really large family unit, um, very combined and it was three AIFS girls. Um, and then my host family as well, we had a cat Felipe and a dog Simone. Um, and so I love animals. I just really love my host family. It was very like warm and inviting and it was very extended. Like we knew the neighbors um, we went to her grandparents' house a few times. Um, and so it was just a really great way to kind of get to know the community and that area. Very cool. And everyone else, go ahead and feel free to pop right in when you're ready. Um, I'll follow up. So my host family was a nuclear family. There was a mom and dad and two boys. Um, the sons were 18 and 14 and I'm also from a family where I'm the oldest and me and my brother are four years apart. So I can connect with the two boys um, just on, like, you know, brother time and just, yeah, in general. But the, the most impactful thing for me was hearing their stories and like how different each person within that house lived, you know, completely different lives and had different interests and, you know, or, completely different. And I also had um, AFS students who lived below me um, and their host parents were the mom of my host mother. So occasionally we like come together for dinner or um, they would have like family dinners and literally I was invited in and she was like another one of their sons. Um, also had a roommate who was from Minnesota and yeah, he was pretty cool. I wasn't expecting really to have a roommate, but that was that was cool too. I enjoyed it. And yeah. I love that you have an extended family sort of within the building. That's really cool. Yeah. It was huge. And I'm not sure if I explained this, but it was Granada, Spain is very, um, space isn't very readily available. So, you know, a lot of the, the homes or our apartment styles, unless you go out into like, the country, which I did, I rented a bike and I'd ride out into the country. And they're like these little shacks or like small houses, which are built into the side of the rocks or like within the mountain. And it's pretty primitive. And, you know, that was a, the two contrasting and juxtaposing like parts of one city is, is insane to me to just see how people live differently, especially just from over here on the East Coast of Jersey. So, yeah. Very cool. Um, I can jump in. Um, so I had a very similar situation to Kimani. I don't know. It almost sounds like we had the same host family because I lived with, you know, two host parents, two host brothers. My host mom's mom lived right downstairs. Um, so that was super cool. I don't know. Did you have Pilu as your host mom? Yes, I did. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. This is crazy. That's crazy. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and their mom, Pilar. Yeah. Thing. That's crazy. 
Oh my gosh. Okay. So we had the same host family and it was the absolute best because we were just always with everyone all the time. Um, My host mom's little nieces and nephews would come over. I would help them with their homework. It was like so much fun. And this is just crazy. I can't believe we never (laughs) made that connection before. Yeah. We literally lived in the same exact place. Yeah. (laughs) People and we're both ambassadors. That's crazy. I feel like this is a blog post getting ready to happen right here. <laughs> Seriously. We should do an interview with uh, your guys' host family and the two of you. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> cool. Well, we can have, we can bounce over to someone else since uh, we've heard of his family story. Okay, sure. Um, it's so hard with Zoom doing popcorn, but... Um, so I lived in pretty much the city center of Berlin, uh, a neighborhood called Moabit, with a lovely couple. Um, they were a bit older. Their kids were, uh, they had four kids, but they were all moved out. Um, I think they were like 30, 33, 26, and 22, or 20. Um, and the youngest daughter, was applying to university and then moved out about a month after I got there, but I got to know her pretty well. And then the rest of the kids, um, kids, they're adults, but um, (laughs) they would all, they all lived in Berlin. So they came over all the time. Um, I was the only host student there or guest student there, but my host parents had 21 students before I got there. So I was their 22nd student. and it was really just a blast and I'm still in contact with them and stuff. Yeah. Oh, cool. That's what we see a lot with our homes. Obviously, you know, we have multiple students staying um, with the same families, but a lot of them will stick with us for many years, just like, you know, Sadie's family. Um, really, you build kind of, you build an actual family, I think, within, you know, within the, within the program, which is really neat. Um, cool. Madison or Whitney, if you guys want to jump in. Yeah, I think I'm the last one, Um, but um, so my family was similar, I guess, to a lot of yours. Um, I had a host mom, host dad, um, and they had four children, but two were moved out. Um, So the two that were living in our place yet were about my age. They were like 19 and 20. They were twins. Um, So that was interesting in itself, but um, so it was just the five of us then. and it was pretty center of Grenoble, which was very convenient. Um, and I loved the location. Um, and ironically, I actually, I got to my location a few days early and just explored the city. And I happened to take a picture of the square and my apartment without even knowing that that's where I was going to stay. Um, so like looking back at my pictures, I was like, that's pretty cool. Just thought it was a beautiful building and that's ended up that's where I ended up living so um thought that was kind of cool but um as far as like the responsibilities in my household my um host dad was a professor at the um some campus I don't know if it was where I was going but um he was like a music professor and it was it's very common in France for the wives to kind of stay home and be a house mom um so that's what my host mom was she would always cook us a dinner um, and just be awake if I felt like at the crack of dawn, um, but stay up until I would go to bed. Um, but yeah, so it's very, very homey. They were very welcoming. Um, definitely got along with them. Um, but yeah. Very cool. And Alina, why did you decide to choose a homestay out of all the other options that you would have had? Yeah, um, so I picked a homestay for a couple of reasons. The first one is I really wanted to learn Spanish and I wanted to learn how to speak it well. Um, And so a homestay I truly believe is the best option for that because you're forced to use the language all the time. There is no break. Um, My host parents and my host brothers really didn't speak English at all. So I had to be constantly practicing my Spanish and trying to speak with them. Um, Another reason was because I really wanted to be integrated into the culture. Um, And there's really no better teacher than 
people that are actually living there and are actually part of the culture. Um, so my host family was the greatest resource in terms of like getting settled and learning sort of just the general practices of what it's like to be a Spaniard, um, which, and it's amazing when you go abroad, the things that you don't know how to do. Like I thought I knew how to go, you know, to the grocery store, did not know how to go to a grocery store in Spain, right? So those were all things that my host family uh, really taught me and, and helped me through. And they're just, they're always there and they're always really helpful. And the last reason was because it was also the cheapest option um, with homestays, all meals, laundry, everything's included. So for me, it was the cheapest option living in Granada. Um, and it was always nice to wait that when I wanted a meal, there was one waiting for me um, at my homestay. So those were the main reasons why, why I picked a homestay. <laughs> and that's a really good point. Um, definitely when it comes to affordability, a lot of the times um, homestays are the base level of our program fees. So you can check this out on their website to really see all the details, but a lot of times that becomes the default. Um, so it does end up being um, more affordable um, for first semester and summer programs. Does anyone else want to talk about, you know, the reasons why they chose to do a homestay? Um, I feel like I had a lot of similar reasons to Alina. I definitely chose a homestay because I really wanted to improve my Spanish um, and my host mom and also my kind of host mom that lived above me, both didn't speak any English. Um, and so they really, really pushed me to speak in Spanish. Um, and so that helped me a lot with language retention. But another reason that Alina didn't mention that for me was really important was security. Um, just as a young woman being in a like foreign country by myself, I kind of liked having that support system and security system there rather than living in like a student apartment by myself. Um, it just made me feel so much safer that my host mom was there, that I had her WhatsApp. And like Alina said, that she could tell me kind of how to go to the grocery store, like kind of how to be an Argentinian and get around correctly. Um, because I feel like she gave me really, really valuable advice that I wouldn't have known if I was just staying um, in an apartment by myself. Definitely, that is a very, very good point. Um, and I think, you know, kind of pivoting a little bit, um, you know, you talked kind of about, you know, some of the things that were great. Um, I think students tend to really worry about what is what what is a homestay family going to be like, you know, uh, are they going to be checking up on me? Do I need do I have a curfew? Um, and I'm wondering, I think Whitney, I think this one is for you, you know, what were some of the, you know, challenges that you may have faced um, whilst you were in a homestay? Yeah, so the biggest thing was, even though it was a great thing, the language. Um, so I also took, or I wanted to do a homestay because of being immersed in the language more and um, having like a guide and a teacher outside of the classroom to help me. Um, but it definitely made it challenging. My host mom was very fluent, I would say, in English. So that did help a little bit if I didn't understand something or she would translate for me, um, especially if they would have people over. Um, but like my host dad, he didn't know a ton of English. Um, so trying to communicate with him, um, especially if we were the only two in the kitchen, say, um, like eating breakfast or something, like if we're trying to talk rather than just sit in silence, um, it would be a little complicated to um, try to translate in my head, like what I'm trying to say, and then say it or make him understand at least. Um, and then even, um, as I mentioned, I had uh, twin brothers that were living with me. They talk very fast. So that was like, cause obviously they're fluent. So like, just like we speak English, it's fast for foreigners. Their speaking was so fast. Um, and so that was the biggest challenge, I think, for me, um, another challenge I would just say, like, would just be learning the customs of like French people. Um, even just learning how to do the laundry, like that I felt was in a way like difficult because it's different. They didn't have drying machines. So then I had to hang it all up and like just how they do that, how they live. Um, like they always ate dinner, um, but they would eat at like, nine o'clock at night. Um, so just kind of working my schedule around that or yeah, I would just say in general, learning all the different customs that are definitely different than in the US. Um, yeah, those are two big challenges I think that I had to face. 
Some really good points. I'm curious as, um, and anyone can jump in and answer this, I'm curious as to, you know, when you're thinking about the customs or, you know, really you're moving into someone's house, what was, you know, did you have, did you have a conversation with the family that first day about, you know, um, uh, you know, any sort of not rules, but any sort of like living standards or did you work with the program beforehand to get like a list of, you know, expectations before y'all um, popped into someone, um, someone's house that you maybe didn't know before? Um, oh. You can go ahead. Oh, okay, thanks. Um, so for my homestay placement, we wrote a letter to our potential homestay people. Um, I don't know if that's the case for everywhere, but in Berlin we did it. And they wrote me a letter back. And in that letter, I mean, because they're such seasoned host parents, I suppose, they laid out a few ground rules. So we didn't even, like we knew before I got there. Um, the only thing that they were very strict about was um, shower time. So I, we were not allowed to be in the shower for more than 10 minutes. And they were like, if you can do five, that'd be great. So um, it's very environmentally conscious, especially in Berlin. But um, basically we had that and then a little conversation of like, oh, here's how you use the keys and just text me if you're gonna be out and all that stuff. Not the first day, well, the keys were the first day, but then after that initial night, then we had a, a more in-depth kind of conversation. As, as things came up, I would just ask. That's what I would encourage anyone to do. Because um, the reason that they're homestay people is because they want to help you. So ask questions. Yeah. Definitely. It sounds like it's a really good mutual respect. Um, we have Kimoni. Kimoni, did you want to add anything? Yeah, just like you said, the respect and the understanding that you know you are a newcomer into this space, and like that's not your property, no matter like what is there, you know. I just feel they'll ask for permission for anything and everything um, until you get the green light. Like for example, um, like breakfast was a meal that we weren't served. Um, we would get lunch and we would get dinner served to us. But breakfast was kind of DIY in the morning before your class. And it's, um, there's like, does, there were designated cabinets for, you know, little muffins and cereal. And I would have tea in the morning before my class. Yeah, I, like Sadie said, like with the keys and everything, you they'll go over what they want you to real like strict ground rules, so to speak. But you know everything else, I feel as though should be sort of fluid, and you know you should have a conversation with your host family and water and like environmental like consciousness is a huge thing in Spain as well. So yeah, definitely. Um, and kind of, you know, looking at some of the, the best experiences, I mean, I've heard so many great stories about y'all's time in your, with your host families and, you know, coming home and, and sharing all of that. Um, Sadie, do you want to give, you know, what was your favorite part of your homestay experience? Sure. Um, so hard to pick, just one thing. But um, my favorite part of living in a homestay was the fact that I got to meet so many more local people than I would have otherwise. It's really great in a lot of places you have professors that are from the country. That's what it's super great to study abroad that way. And then you might meet your resident director and then maybe another person, but like with a homestay, I met my host siblings and then I met their significant others and then I met our neighbors and then they took us out to do all of these things that I wouldn't have necessarily done otherwise. I got introduced to my host sister's good friend. And then even without my host sister, that friend invited me to Poland with her and like nine other people. And I would have never met all of these Germans if I hadn't done that. So like you are, you have a built in social network when you get there immediately. And just one more thing, if I could, <laughs> um, it's also like having a, a live guidebook with you at all times that you can ask questions and and just learn so much more about the place that you're living. Yeah, it seems like such a cool experience. Does anyone else want to share, you know, what, you know, either a favorite story that they've had with their host family or, um, you know, another thing that they um, really enjoyed about the whole experience? 
Sure, I can um, jump in. Um, so uh, I really love just the little things with my host family. Um, so every evening um, I would sit with my host dad and my host mom and we'd watch game shows. And it was like, one, a great way to learn Spanish and two, just like a lot of fun. It was like, we were constantly talking about like, oh, what's gonna happen tomorrow? Like, are they finally gonna win and like hit the jackpot? And it was like those little experiences or like me just standing in the kitchen talking with my host mom while she's cooking and just sort of watching what she's doing. Um, those were some of the richest and most special experiences that I had and that I absolutely would not have had if I wasn't living in a homestay. Very cool. And you bring up one of my favorite points, the food and the cooking. So I, you know, I've been on a site visit to Spain. So I got to visit a number of, of host families and they all, and it was all in one day and they all made, you know, this delicious home cooked food by the end of the day, I was thought I was going to explode, but I was like, do our students get to eat like this a lot, like all the time. And so any, anyone want to share, you know, some of the, the food or some of the, the delicious uh, bites that y'all got to partake in? <laughs> Oh, I had some of the best food ever from one of my host moms, except there was a bit of a cultural difference. So she told me she was going to make a tortilla, which, uh, you know, to all of us were like, okay, like tortilla is like, it's a flat piece of bread. Well, in Argentina, that it's like a cake made of potatoes and it's like thick. Um, and so I sit down for dinner and she's like, you know, here's your tortilla. And I'm like, okay. Um, it's not what I was expecting, but it was so good. I think about it all the time. It was like a really good like potato cake. Um, and I loved it. And it was really funny when I sat down and was like, what is this? Like, really great. I'll jump in. Um, so my, my host mom, like I mentioned earlier, she was the one that would like cook and stuff and the desserts that she would make. Oh, there was this one that I, I should really ask her for the recipe. Um, I don't even know. They're like yay big. They're really, they're small little like bread things. But then they have like the, I think she called them like pralines, but they weren't like a praline like here. They were like these reddish pink things that you stick in the dough. And then I don't know, they just add some crunch, but they were so good. Like they even sell them in stores and stuff. And I, I bought them a few times but hers were were the best but so she would make like those she made beignets um crepes uh just anything that you can like think of like that's french like it's legit like it's not a stereotype or or anything like that even we had ratatouille for dinner like and like that's a stereotype but they we we had it and oh uh, it was delicious though so yeah the French food, I tell you. Did anyone come back with better cooking skills? Anyone help in the kitchen or were your uh, host moms like, stay back? <laughs> Fair enough. I feel like I got some skills. I just watched her. She, my host mom was very against using recipes. She was very, um, she didn't like all the instructions and how many ingredients things took. <laughs> so I think I got like a, a more like loose and like, what an attitude in the kitchen. So I like make soups and stuff without looking at risotto, without looking at it, things. Um, but I did want to say that I'm, I'm vegetarian. So you would think, oh, German food doesn't, it's not really vegetarian. But my host mom was also vegetarian, which was fun. And she would make me vegetarian versions of like schnitzel. So she used a celery root to make schnitzel. And it was like the coolest thing ever. And I, I still don't know how she did it. And I want to know. <laughs> She put a little bit of this and a little bit of that and it made it, you know? <laughs> like, oh, you had a recipe. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, And that's great. And that's a really good point is that, um, you know, a lot of students, especially if you have dietary needs or restrictions, just make sure that you tell your admissions officers as soon as possible and they can maybe hook you up with, um, you know, homestay families that are able to accommodate. Um, our, our families, I think, have seen everything and probably worked with students from all different, you know, dietary needs. So um, definitely let us know as soon as you can about, you know, anything that you may need. Um, 
So, you know, for most of you, you've been back for a while. Um, and Kimoni, I'm wondering, it sounds like, you know, you became such a big brother to, um, to your host family. Do you still keep in contact with them at all since you've come home? Yeah, occasionally I'll reach out to them. Um, I know for New Year's last year, everyone talks about going to New York, no matter where you are in the world, New York Times Square, like New Year's Day is like a thing. People from the East Coast, people all around the world want to do it. And um, I got back in December and my little brother posed the idea to me, like my actual little brother, not from Spain, but he posed the idea of like, let's go on, let's take the train out to the city. And um, that day, like I FaceTimed my host brothers and like my mom sent them some videos and they sent me videos back of them having like a, you know, just like a family get together, drinking wine and everything. And yeah, that was, I still keep in contact with them, but that was like the most memorable moment, you know, of our communication after, you know, getting back into the States. But yeah, I feel as though it's hard. Everyone has different lives and, you know, we live thousands of miles away. So I don't expect anyone to reach out to me every day or every month, you know, like when we speak, we speak. And just leave it as that, you know. Exactly. Has anyone else kept in contact with their families? Yeah. I think it's hard not to when you, you know, you make a bond so quickly. That's one of the strangest things about studying abroad. And what I can imagine with the homestay family is you're not there for an incredibly long time. You know, usually a, you know, usually a semester, maybe a full year, like Alina, if you know, you'd have the chance to be gone for that long, but those bonds that you make, you know, they're strong and, and they, they happen pretty quickly, which is really, really neat. Um, I've definitely heard of, you know, host families, you know, keeping in touch, even, you know, just here and there. Um, but students will end up going back to visit their host families they'll really you know invite them to their wedding you know or you know send photos of their kids so it definitely be, can become you know a lifelong um friendship and and um it's pretty neat i've had i've even had friends who have studied abroad and then years later will take their biological parents to go visit their homestays um and so the two mamas can meet um which is always uh, to me sounds pretty special um very cool. And I just want to kind of, you know, um, I don't want to take, I want to have enough time for questions, but I did have one final uh, thing to throw at y'all. Alina, if you want to take the lead on this one, and then any one of y'all can jump in. Um, what would you, you know, do you have any tips for, you know, successful home, um, homestay experiences that you would suggest students keep in mind as they prepare? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the most important thing to keep in mind is that like your host family is there for you. They've likely had foreign students before, so they understand what you're going through, the difficulties of being in a new place, being with new people. So really like you should really try to just reach out because they really want to help you. And like my host family in the beginning, they were very polite. They didn't want to bother us. You know, they wanted to make sure everything was okay. And so I just kind of like threw myself out there and I was like, okay, I'm going to be here and I'm going to sit on the couch with you and we're going to figure this out. Um, and that was really the best way. And I was really close with my host mom and my host dad because of that. Um, so I think that's really important. I would also say, you know, keep in mind that this is a different culture. They have different customs and you're going to have to adapt to that. Um, for me, the biggest one was getting used to how time works in Spain. It's very different. Um, for me, it was always go, 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 go. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. And in Spain, it's like, we're gonna chill in the middle of the day and take a nap. And so I had to learn and adjust to that. Um, so I would say, you know, yes, you know, who you are is really important, but you're gonna, you're gonna need to adjust. You're gonna need to be flexible. Um, and your host family is there to help you through that. That is a very good tip. Any other tips that y'all have? I think one for before the process, it, like when the process is beginning, like before you even get there, is to be super honest and particular when you're putting in your application to be a homestay um, about what you want and like who you are. Um, if you want to live with a non-smoker or if you hate kids, <laughs> you just don't want to live with children, or if you want to live with a single woman or whatever, just like put that down and don't feel bad if you're being like, oh, I'm, I'm being really picky because this is like supposed to be your home and you don't want to feel uncomfortable in your home. 
and they're really good about placing people. And that's really what makes a successful homestay is you being super honest and then adjusting to culture once you get there, like Alina said. And just to confirm as well, the only people that see your housing application are our resident directors and staff. Um, so, you know, we're not going to tell your biological mom that you're a, a you know, a night owl. Uh, it's okay, your secret is safe with us. But absolutely, to, to confirm what Sadie said, like, be honest in, in your housing preferences, because that is the best way for our staff to know how to make a good fit for you, um, you know, while you're, while you're abroad. It brings up a good point to remind. I mean, I know not everything is daisies when you go abroad, right? There may be some challenges that happen with your host family. And that's what our residential, you know, directors are also there to help with, um, you know, working out any kinks at the beginning or, you know, mid through the program, um, kind of help mediating, you know, anything that may come up because it's probably not going to be perfect. Nothing is, you know, it's just like living with roommates on, on college campuses, stuff can pop up, but, you know, they'll help with communication and, and, and all of that. So, um, so, yeah, just to keep that in mind too. Any other final tips before we open it up? I do have a question, or come on, you go ahead. Yeah, just um, like everyone said so far, like honesty and communication. Um, the last thing you want, I feel as though, is to have a weird relationship or like, you know, have some type of turmoil within the house, you know, because I witnessed it and, you know, it, it, it just doesn't sit right. Like you, everyone sits down together for dinner and it's just, it's uncomfortable and it's awkward and, you know, things like that can be avoided through conversation and being honest with yourself first and like with the people you live with, because one, they're not your parents and two, you know, they can't restrict you from doing anything other than like impeding in their household and things that would actually impact their house. So, and them and their people, you know, so yeah, definitely be honest and have a strong level of communication and understanding and also being flexible because if there's something that you don't like you know speak up on it especially food if that was something um to kind of go back to a previous topic but like food um i remember um my house mom offered me macarones which are like fried fish little small fried fish and i was thinking like macaroni to be completely honest and she comes out with this plate of fish and i just look at her and i'm just like like, I don't know about this one. And she said, squeeze some lemon on it, squeeze lemon on it. And it just was not my thing. And yeah, after that, she never gave it to me again. So just be honest and be open and, you know, communicate. <laughs> I'm proud of you for trying it though, right? Like you tried it, it's okay, it's not your thing. You still can say that you tried it though. Exactly. Never again, not my thing. <laughs> Definitely. Very cool. Well, does anyone in the the audience want to, you know, pop on and ask any questions they may have of our um, brilliant alumni? And if not, well, we're also going to be sending this, um, this session out and we can always, you know, have you contact the alum um, through emails um, at the end of this, but. And that was something I wanted to mention as well. Um, although we have uh, several alumni ambassador on that represent the different locations. We have alumni from all of our program locations. So if you have your heart set on New Zealand and you don't see an ambassador in this space from New Zealand, just send us an, an email at alumni at AIFS.com. Um, I'm the person you're going to be emailing and I'm happy to connect you to uh, whichever location participants you would like to talk to um, and be able to get you some more information in that space as well. I am going to stop the recording that way if anyone has any questions but maybe they're being a little shy they don't have to worry about being recorded so i'm going to uh, thank everyone for joining us today thanks for michelle for hosting and for all of our fantastic alumni ambassadors for sharing their experiences this recording will be made available and at this point i'm going to go ahead and turn it off <laughs>